Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am, oh golly, I'm losing my earring. I am very late today. My sincere apologies. I'm very late today. My word, it's seven minutes past seven already. But maybe you can forgive me because it's, it is a public holiday. <laughs> It is Good Friday and it is a holiday. I'm trying to get myself all set up and accounted for here. And we had prophetic school last night. Good morning, beautiful Brigitte. And um, yeah, uh, it's just a little bit difficult the next morning or sometimes to get up. Good morning, terrific Tishka. Welcome, my beautiful friend. So apologies for being late this morning. Good morning, magnificent Martha. I haven't seen you for a while. Good morning, special Sam. Welcome. I'm seriously impressed with all of you beautiful people. Lakshini, my beautiful friend. Michelle, welcome. So good to see Lakshini and Michelle, these beautiful people who also, and gorgeous Tessa, famous Chantal, wonderful Tamsin. I am a bit tired, Tessa, I'm not going to lie. Good morning, special Sebs. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh my word, I'm so super excited by all of you people who are on this early morning broadcast after being at the prophetic school last night. Okay, Tamsin has, has Littlies, so I can understand why she's awake early. But um, everybody else, thank you for joining me this morning. Good morning, delightful Danette. I was... Um, kind of thinking okay it's good friday it's a public holiday so possibly you know um i'm going to be kind of alone <laughs> this morning and i'll have a whole lot of people watching the replay but it is so wonderful good morning estralita my gorgeous it's so wonderful to see you all on this morning and to have you all here with me Oh my goodness, Bertha, my beautiful Bertha friend, I just, I don't know. I wish I could, I wish I could help you. I know that for some people after Wednesday, it helped for them to go out and in again to restart their devices. Um, I think for most of the people who struggled. Good morning, beautiful Sonia daughter. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I don't feel beautiful this morning, I'm just being honest, because I am actually quite tired. And I kind of was putting my makeup on this morning thinking, my word, Sally, you need a bit extra this morning, but there wasn't time to put extra on. <laughs> so, um, and my voice, if my voice sounds a little bit croaky, it's it often is... Um, after you know after prophetic school the next morning my voice is a bit croaky because i've spoken for so long bertha tessa says that you must click on live chat or at the bottom left or go out and in again and i'm just telling you that because you can't read the comments but that's what tessa says so that will hopefully fix your comments issue so um uh, Radiant Rose, welcome, beautiful. Good morning, gorgeous Fiona. Oh my word, Sylvia. My special Sylvia. Good morning, amazing Anthea. We are going to pray right now. Um, Lord God, we just bring Sylvia. Oh my word, we just bring Sylvia and her daughter and her daughters, the three children, especially Tammy Lee, Lord God, um, Sylvia's very special granddaughter. We just bring them all before you this morning with, the, with everything that has happened, the, the, the devastating news that they received, the shock of what has happened to their father. Oh, Lord God, we just, our hearts grieve. Our hearts are so filled with compassion and love and grief for this incredible family, the, this amazing family, Lord God. And right now, we stand with them because it says in your word that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And we mourn with them this morning, Lord God. And we just decree and declare that justice will be done in this instance. That the justice that is so often lacking in our nation will come through for Sylvia's family 
in this instance that justice will be done lord god that unrighteousness will be defeated lord god that you see the bigger picture lord god and you have a plan no matter what the enemy throws at this family you have a plan you have a plan lord god and we just decree and declare that plan over sylvia and over her family over her precious daughter over those beautiful grandchildren we just over tammy lee we decree and declare your plan your destiny your purpose that those things will be unhindered by the terrible thing that they have experienced and lord we just ask for your shalom peace to visit that family, to cover that family, that you would cover them with the blood of the Lamb, with the blood, your blood, Lord God, your sacrificial blood that we that we celebrate this weekend as as the fact that you died for us, Lord, so that we could live in you. And we cover Sylvia and her family with your blood. And we stand with her as a community. We stand with her as a family. We stand with her as a church without walls in this time of desperation and need and grief and shock and loss. And we come against the trauma that has been visited on this family, that, they will, that there will be no long-term effects to that trauma, that that trauma will not be allowed to gain a foothold in this family and give the enemy legal access here but that Lord that you would work in this situation as only you can work and that you will bring about your resurrection power your resurrection power and you would be you would be you would be love compassion grace mercy and kindness to them Lord as only you can be, that you would cover them, that you would hold them, that you would cradle them, that you would love on them. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we cry out, Lord God, for these deeds that are perpetrated on a day like today, on a day like Good Friday. And we ask, Lord God, that Sylvia's son-in-law, that his death be not in vain, that his death be not in vain, but that your will be done here and your promises and your prophecies and your purposes be fulfilled, even through this tragic, awful, horrendous happening. Thank you, Father, for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for who you are to us and that at times like this we can turn to you. Sylvia, my beautiful, special friend, we love you. We love you. We love you. And we are all of us holding your family in prayer, praying for them, speaking the blood of Jesus over them, and just sending you the most enormous love and hugs and support in the spirit that we possibly can. We love you so much. And we're so sorry for this devastating loss. So, wow. Yes, just awful. It's like you don't actually know what to say. But welcome to everybody else who has come on to the live this morning since, since I was praying for Sylvia. Good morning, Radiant Renal. Apologies if I didn't have an opportunity to greet you. I, um, I was just praying for my special friend and just, yeah, just needed to needed to to do that to be a part of her grief and her sorrow because we share in each other's joy and rejoicing and we share in each other's grief and each other's sorrow good morning magnificent Magda and wow yeah so I am just finding my space in my bible for what we are going to be speaking about today and I need some water there we go Mm. not very much water good morning Raid and Renee good morning Nadine it's so lovely to have you on the live my friend welcome welcome lovely to see you I am really good morning gorgeous curl I hope you're noticing the earrings <laughs> my gorgeous curl friend gave me these earrings so there we go um, I hope everybody is admiring my beautiful earrings because I absolutely love them and um, I'm so, so happy to have them. And 
Good morning, Louise. Lovely, Louise. Good Friday must be almost over in New Zealand. So, um, I was going to say something now. Oh, yes, my, um, <laughs> I'm glad you know it. <laughs> my beautiful friend, Evren, who sometimes, she normally watches the replays. She gave me some advice about drinking um, for my voice because my voice doesn't always last for the live. She gave me advice about drinking honey um, in warm water or something to the night, like before I go to bed after the prophetic school and then my voice will be fine the next morning. And um, I didn't, I didn't try that last night. I was, I was too tired to try that last night, but gorgeous Chantal gave me some beautiful raw honey. And so I will definitely be using that in the morning. Yes, um, for those of you ladies who uh, attended the prophetic school last night, it was glorious. It was absolutely glorious. It was just, yeah, it was just wonderful. Just, just wonderful how God moved, how the spirit moved, how it, it was just absolutely amazing. So we were so blessed. We were so spoiled by the Lord last night. We were really so spoiled by the Lord last night. It was such a significant evening, so specific to the people that were there and just amazing. Good morning, wonderful Volna. Yes, thank you, Anthea. <laughs> I love my nails. <laughs> my nails, my earrings, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I can be a real princess if I choose to be, which is what my name means. So that's all good. But anyway, so, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, Conrad. I saw your name pop up, but didn't have a chance to greet you, but have to greet the one man who has no issue, apart from Stuart, with showing his face on my lives. Welcome, welcome. So, we have been speaking this week about Passion Week or Holy Week, the week leading up to, good morning, beautiful Brenda friend. Welcome, my darling. Um, we have been speaking about Passion Week or Holy Week, which is the week leading up to the weekend where Jesus was crucified, where we commemorate and to a degree celebrate the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord. And I, whenever I say celebrate, it kind of catches me and I think, oh, it seems, sounds terrible to celebrate his crucifixion, which was absolutely horrendously awful. But at the same time, you know, even Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him and we do celebrate it because of what the price that he paid for us and because of what he did for us so we do we do celebrate that there is a celebration aspect to that even while we mourn what he had to go through to pay that price and <laughs> my beautiful Brenda friend if you ever want to just pop in with hills you are welcome <laughs> so Yes, Melanie's name is spelled very uniquely. I have to be sure that I spell it correctly when I chat about Melanie. So, no, not that sounds wrong, Melanie. That sounds like I'm talking about you behind your back. I don't mean that at all. <laughs> I mean, whenever I write your name or anything like that, I have to bear in mind that your name is spelled very uniquely, and that is because you are very unique. So, I heard somebody speaking the other day, it was some random person, I don't know who he was, but he was saying uh, something about that, you know, he doesn't understand why we call this Holy Week, uh, because it's no, the week is no more holy than any other week, um, even though, you know, it's the death and the resurrection. In our calendar today, in 2024, the week isn't holy. And I just thought, oh, I must say I was a little bit just irritated because I just thought we're not saying, nobody's saying that this week is holy. You know, that this week in 2024 is holy. Nobody's saying that. You know, what we're saying is that that week, that week that led up to the death and the resurrection of our Savior, that was a holy week. And we commemorate that holy week in our week here in 2024. But nobody is saying that you know, that this particular week in April 2024 is a holy week. It's, it, it isn't any more holy, you know, in its, 
in the way that it is than any other week, absolutely. But we're not saying that this week is holy. We're saying that we are commemorating the holy week or the passion week that took place in the days that Jesus that led Jesus to the cross. And it's, I mean, and I feel as though, and I know that a lot of these commemorations, and I know that people have an enormous issue with Easter, and I, I generally try not to call it Easter, um, because Easter has nothing to do with, with the death and the resurrection of our Saviour. But at the same time, and I know that a lot of these things like Holy Week and like um, Passion Week and the Day of Controversy and Maundy Thursday and Lent, for example, you, you know, many of those, many of those things we feel belong um, as, as um, evangelicals or as charismatics or as people who attend non-denominational churches. We feel that that belongs to, you know, some sort of denominational stream, you know, or because it comes out of the, the Catholic Church, a lot of it, that we have to ignore it and, you know, and all of And I just think that it's, it's in, moving, in moving away from denominations and into sort of this more loosely non-denominational charismatic space, um, we, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater to a large degree. And remembering, you know, remembering not just the day that Jesus died and the day that he was resurrected, but everything that he did that week before he went to the cross was incredibly significant. And if we are going to honor the price that Jesus paid for us, then we need to honor all that he did and all that he spoke about and all that he went through leading up to that sacrifice that he made on the cross because, because he did everything he did in that week knowing what was coming. Knowing what was coming. I don't know about you, but I tend to be the kind of person that if I know something is coming, especially something really difficult or something, you know, like, you know, like a, um, a very significant doctor's appointment or, um, or I have to go for blood tests or I have to go for scans or, you know, that sort of thing. If I know that that's coming up, often for a few days before that, I almost can't do anything because you know, that kind of consumes my thoughts, actually, you know, because I'm dreading it and, you know, or I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about it or, and it kind of becomes this big thing in my brain. And then I sort of struggle to actually just go through my normal week. And, and all I want to do is just go and get it over with because so that life can carry on. And good morning, Nolitandu. Welcome. Welcome, my friend. Good to see you. And and you know that's me okay and that's me in my flesh and as a human being but but you can just imagine that Jesus knew Jesus knew what was coming he knew what he was going to have to do and yet he spent that whole entire week apart from the Wednesday where the biblical text doesn't tell us what he did on the Wednesday and so scholars assume that he rested with his disciples and you know taught them more etc but he, we, we forget that everything that he did in that week leading up to his crucifixion, he did knowing what was coming. And yet he, and yet he did so many significant things. He shared so many significant things. He dealt with so many significant things. And I think instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, you know, this all belongs to old denominational stuff and we don't do that anymore. Um, I think we need to look at things and be like, what is worth honoring and following? And I don't, you know, I don't prescribe to anybody what you should or shouldn't do. If you choose to, to acknowledge and participate in Lent, for example, Absolutely. If that's what you, how you feel that you honor God and, and you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, go for it. Absolutely go for it. If you choose to, you know, fully celebrate Passover, which is towards the end of April, if you choose to fully celebrate that the, the way that Jewish people celebrate Passover, absolutely go for it. Each one of us needs to do what we are convicted by the Holy Spirit to do. And for me, I feel very called to almost marry 
the, 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 the good and beautiful things from our, the history of our faith with the good and beautiful things that Jesus would have partaken in as a Jew. And it's almost like what we tend to do as believers is we th completely throw one thing out so that we can, you know, so that we can celebrate another thing and focus on that. But more and more, even as I delve into the Jewish stuff and into the Jewish calendar and into the Jewish feasts, more and more I feel this, this call, this conviction by the Holy Spirit to marry what is good and beautiful from our, the history of our faith and what is good and beautiful from the Jewish faith together, to be able to celebrate both, to be able to fully participate in both. Having said that, I did not <laughs> do Lent, um, and not for any religious reasons, just simply because I've got a lot, so much other stuff going on. It was just something that I couldn't actually give my full attention to. And so I didn't. But I have actually stopped eating a whole lot of things. So I was like, okay, well, there we go. There's my Lent. But, uh, but you know, I want us to get the fullness of what Jesus paid for. The fullness of that. And so in the fullness of what Jesus paid for, we need to fully acknowledge the Jewish roots of our faith and the, the God, the God-ordained calendar and the God-ordained feasts and festivals that will be fulfilled by the coming of Jesus again to the earth. And at the same time, we need to fully acknowledge the, the, uh, the history of our faith. You notice that I'm not saying the history of the church as in man-made religious institution. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the history of our faith, the things that, that our faith has to be, to be proud of, to, to celebrate. And we, we need to do that. If you have children, if you have family that don't believe and you celebrate Easter with them and buy Easter eggs for your grandchildren, you know, I, there is no condemnation here. My boys are enormous and I still buy them an Easter egg at Easter. We have and we all will have a, a lunch together on Easter Sunday. And they understand the concept of what happened over the weekend, but they over this weekend, that the, the concept of what we're commemorating, but they still in their minds are very much in the sort of Easter thing rather than in the death and resurrection of Jesus thing. And, you know, if that is what you do for your family because it brings your family together and it's an opportunity for you to speak to them about what Easter is actually about, then, you know, we need to do that. We need to do that. And we all know the roots of these festivals and the pagan things and all of that kind of thing. We all know that. But at the same time, we serve a God who is bigger than all of that. Sometimes I think we just give the enemy too much credit. You know, we just, we think if we buy an Easter egg for someone, you know, then the enemy is just going to completely desecrate what, what, what the death and the resurrection of Christ means. God is bigger than that. We all know that that's what this weekend is about. You know that. When you buy your lint bunny, you know, that, that doesn't detract from what this weekend is about for you. And it's not, God is bigger than that. God is so much bigger than all of that. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so if I buy Easter eggs for my boys, I just plead the blood of Jesus over them. And I'm just like, you know, no, you're not going to make this about you, enemy. You're not going to make this about some pagan festival to somebody else. This is about my Savior. This is about my Jesus. This is about the price my Jesus paid for me, for me, and for every single one of you. And I'm going to celebrate that with my family. And I'm going to talk to them about Jesus but I'm going to do it in such a way that they can relate to what is happening. Okay, that was a bit of a digression. I actually wasn't planning on saying all of that, but I feel like we just need to remove the condemnation and sometimes the feeling that we have to make this choice, you know, about 
as long, you know, if God convicts you to make a choice, that's a completely different story. But so many Christians walk in this condemnation and when they're giving their kids Easter eggs, they have this guilt, you know, that they're somehow um, participating in some kind of, you know, pagan ritual. And you're not. If your heart is fully surrendered to Jesus, you're not. You, you're not. You are celebrating and commemorating the enormous price that was paid for you so that you now walk in eternal life. And that deserves celebrating. So we have looked at, and we haven't spent nearly as much time on this as I would like to have, but anyway, that's, you know, the Holy Spirit does what he wants to do, uh, which is absolutely fine with me. I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. So we looked at on Monday, we didn't look at Monday on Monday, we looked at Palm Sunday on Monday. So we looked at Palm Sunday on Monday, which, was, which is day one of this Holy Week or Passion Week, which is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then Monday is the day that Jesus cleansed the temple and... Um, <laughs> I wanted to say debated with the Pharisees and the religious leaders, but it's not really a debate, is it? He just completely sets them straight, which is absolutely amazing. And then on Tuesday, on Tuesday of this week is the day that Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. And he then gives his, his Olivet discourse. He, he passed, they passed the, the fig tree. Remember Jesus has cursed the fig tree and they passed the fig tree on their way. And then Jesus speaks to his disciples about the importance of faith. I want you to bear in mind as we talk about all this, that we are building up to the, to, to Jesus's death. So, and the fact that Jesus knew that that's what he was building up to. So everything that he spoke about, everything he did in that week, was specifically knowing that he was going to the cross. He was preparing his disciples, even though they appeared, to just not completely understand, even though he'd said it in as many ways as possible, they still just didn't seem to completely understand exactly what he was saying. But everything that you read about all of those things, you, we need to read it in the context of Jesus preparing his disciples and the people around him for his death and giving them his last, you know, pearls of wisdom and encouragement prior to him leaving them. So his last while he walked on the earth, put it that way, because he does come back and he does speak to the disciples again, but his last while he walked on the earth prior to his crucifixion. So he goes, they go to the Mount of Olives and he then gives his, his Olivet Discourse where he speaks, you know, in parables and he uses symbolic language and he speaks about the end times events and he speaks about his second coming and the final judgment. And scripture tells us that this same Tuesday when Jesus is giving his Olivet Discourse, Judas Iscariot was negotiating with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus and that's in Matthew 26. And so, you know, so Jesus then speaks for the whole day. This Olivet Discourse took up most of the day. And he then goes, um, he then, they then go back to, and that is because we're in Luke. Um, so it's Luke 20, verse 1 to 21, verse 36. Um, and then... And then, and then we have what, what the tr more traditional t um, denominations call Holy Wednesday, which is, nobody, the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus did there. And then we have what the traditional denominations call Maundy Thursday. <laughs> Maundy Thursday. And that is when Jesus now, remember, I've spoken on this before. There is disagreement, as there is with most dates in the Bible, there is disagreement um, amongst scholars and theologians about exactly when Jesus partook of the Passover supper and exactly how the events, you know, rolled out and exactly, you know, there, there is disagreement around exact calendar 
dates and days and things like that. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of that now because we don't know exactly that, you know, people, people cleverer than me and with more knowledge than me have delved into and figured out dates. But, but even those very clever people um, don't all agree on exact timings and exact dates, even using the biblical text as a reference. As far as I'm concerned, we don't have the right dates anyway, necessarily. We don't know for sure. And so we, 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 we just, we celebrate. We, let's not get hung up on exact dates necessarily. I've said before, our calendar and the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrew calendar is not 100% correct. So even that calendar isn't completely exactly on the right dates. So let's not get, you know, the, the, the enemy loves to distract us with stuff like that. So Maundy Thursday, uh, Jesus sends uh, Peter, we're just going to go with it, it being Thursday is what I'm saying. You know, he, he goes and he sends the disciples to get a room and they do, and that is what I want to look at here in um, Luke chapter, Luke chapter 22. In Luke chapter 22, it says, the festival of unleavened bread was drawing near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to do away with Jesus, for they feared the people. Remember that these are the people who were celebrating Jesus on Sunday, and this is Thursday. So the chief priests and the scribes, because they saw the reaction to the people when Je from the people when Jesus entered Jerusalem, they are now want to get rid of Jesus, but they don't know how to without inciting a riot amongst the people. But then it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 3, But then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve apostles. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him and deliver him up to them. And that is on the Tuesday. And then on Maundy Thursday, from um, Luke chapter 22, verse 7, it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be slain. And Jesus sends Peter and John, and he says to them, Go and prepare for us the Passover meal. And they say to him, Where do you want us to prepare it? Because, you know, they didn't know where to go. Well, they had nowhere to go, possibly. And he says to them, When you have gone into the city, a man carrying an earthen jug or pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him into the house which he enters and say to the master of the house, say to the master of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room? Where, may I, where I may eat the Passover meal with my disciples? Do you see how the disciples, how Jesus is continually getting them to step out in faith? They have to go into the city, into the city, the city of Jerusalem with all of these people, bearing in mind that all the Jewish people, who the observant Jewish people, descended on Jerusalem at that time to celebrate Passover because it had to be celebrated in Jerusalem. So it's not as if, you know, there were three people in Jerusalem and one of them was carrying a pitcher of water. All of these people and the disciples have to look out for a man carrying an earthen jug or a pitcher of water do you know how many people would have been walking around carrying pitchers of water and earthen jugs? And then they had to just follow him to wherever he was going in, which sounds a bit stalkerish if you ask me. And then they have to say to him, where is the guest room where the teacher and his disciples are going to celebrate Passover? And he will show you a large room upstairs. Do you know the faith that that must have taken? Do you see how Jesus is pushing his disciples to step out in faith, pushing them to believe the things that he's saying, trying to prepare them for what is to come. And, he's, and they, it says in Luke 22, chapter, verse 13, they found it just as he had said to them. Just as he had said to them. And they made ready the Passover. And Jesus comes and he reclines at the table with the apostles and he says in the Amplified, it says, I have earnestly and intensely desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall eat it no more until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
And what I want to say here, what I want to say here is I want to just talk about the Lord's Supper. I want to talk about communion because that is one thing that I feel like in the, in the church space, in terms of man-made religious institution, communion or the Lord's Supper has become a ritual that we do. And, and when I say this, I speak for myself. You know, um, I find I I find that if my, my husband says to me, for example, you know, I feel like we should do communion together, and he, you know, and he brings the the elements and and you know, and immediately it's you know, thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for us, and we kind of we fall into this sort of formulaic way of doing communion, of of doing the Lord's Supper. And I've realized in reading these scriptures that it's not just part, and obviously sometimes we don't have hours to do communion. You know, sometimes communion is just a, you know, a quick kind of Jesus, thank you for your blood. You know, thank you for your blood. But I feel that we need to take a moment to stop and actually just think about this when we take communion. And I encourage you to, to take communion over this weekend more than once because you can take communion. I also just want to break any religious spirit that tells you that communion can only be taken at a specific time, you know, in a specific place with specific people. You can take communion anytime. You can indulge in the Lord's Supper anytime. You can commune with the elements, the body and the blood of Jesus anytime by yourself, with others, in your home, in somebody else's home, at church. There is no, there is no law, godly law, that says you can only take it one specific time. In Acts, it talks about the, um, I think it's in Acts, um, it talks about the church coming together and the first day that they met, they partook in the Lord's Supper together. And traditional churches took that and said that communion can only be done on Sundays. But that is not the truth. It just so happened that that's how they did it then because they happened to get together on a Sunday. But that they weren't laying down any law. Paul didn't say going forward from that, from now on, the Lord's Supper can only be partaken of on a Sunday. But I want you to take communion this weekend as many times as you feel led and pay careful attention to this. And, he, and so Luke chapter 22, verse 17, and Jesus, he took a cup. And when we come to Passover, I'll do a teaching on the four cups of Passover, because this is what they were doing. They were doing the Passover meal. And the Passover meal comes with four different cups, which mean four different things. And I'll do a teaching on that when we get closer to Passover. But, but he took the cup. He took a cup. That's why it says he took a cup, because there were four different cups. And when he had given thanks, so he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, take this and divide and distribute it among yourselves. And then listen to this. For I say to you that from now on, from that moment, <clears throat> I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine at all all until the kingdom of God comes. I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine at all until the kingdom of God comes. I mean, you could spend an hour just on that. Just on that. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he didn't say, do this in remembrance of me only on a Sunday or only on special occasions. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And actually, every time you have a meal with, with fellow believers, with your family, you are breaking bread. Jesus used the Passover elements, the, the, the challah bread and the wine, to demonstrate what he was saying. 
But what he was saying is that when we get together as believers, when we spend time in each other's company, when we when we have you know community, when we break bread together and take a meal together, we are doing it in remembrance of him. In remembrance of him. And he says, and in like manner he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament or covenant ratified in my blood. The Amplified adds that word, ratified. This is the New Testament or covenant ratified in my blood, which is shed and poured out for you. And why did he say it like that? Because a covenant, if you read the Old Testament and you read that the covenant of the covenants that God undertook with, with Abraham, for example, and the remember when he put Abraham into that, you know, that deep sleep and then he, he, there were the animals and Abraham had to, you know, put them in half and then walk through the blood. Covenants in those days, covenants in those days when God undertook a covenant with his people, it was a very bloody affair. If you go and read that story of the, 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 you know, the animals that had to be cut up and the half here and half there and all of that kind of thing, do you know how much blood that would have involved? And then you walked through the blood with the person you were making the covenant with. It was a very bloody affair. But that was how the covenant was ratified, was with the blood. That was why there was this sacrificial system for the Jewish people, because it was the blood of the animals that, that, was, that, that were sacrificed to cover them. The covenant had to be ratified in blood. And God had not changed his way of doing things. God had not changed his way of doing things. He was going to ratify this covenant that he was now extending not only to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles as well. And this covenant, this expanded, renewed, because many people prefer the word renewed rather than new, because it makes it sound like God forgot about the old covenant, which he definitely did not. So this expanded, renewed covenant had to be ratified with blood. And so it was ratified with the blood of Jesus. And every time you participate in the Lord's Supper or communion, you are saying to the enemy, my covenant with God is ratified in the blood of my Savior. You cannot come against this covenant because it is ratified in the blood of my Savior. It is done and dusted. That is what Jesus was saying. That is what he was saying. So we give thanks. He tells us to give thanks for his body, which he gave up for us. And then he tells us that the covenant is ratified in his blood that has been poured out for us. Just amazing. It's just amazing. And then he, you know, it, he explains that Judas is going to betray him. And he goes down and he talks to, uh, and in Luke chapter 22, verse 28, he said, You are those who have remained throughout and persevered with me in my trials. And as my father has appointed a kingdom and conferred it on me, so do I confer on you the privilege and decree that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And he was speaking to the disciples, but we get to sit at his table and sit in his kingdom at his table both now because we are seated in heavenly places and in eternity because of what he did for us. I think so often we, we, tend, to, we tend to see the crucifixion as Jesus' death for the forgiveness of our sins. And absolutely, but that's not all there was to Jesus' death. Jesus' death ensures us a seat at his table in his kingdom. 
It ensured the, the, the release of the Holy Spirit. It ensured our ability to be able to be seated in heavenly places with him. Jesus died for so much more than we give him credit for sometimes. The forgiveness of sins, obviously an enormous thing, but so much more than that. That's just the beginning. Salvation, the forgiveness of sins is just the beginning. There's a whole kingdom that is still there to be participated in and appropriated for ourselves. And then, of course, you know, he tells Peter what Peter will do. And he speaks, and you can read through all of this. I, I don't have time to go, look, go to all of this. And then he, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, I mean, he has told them all of this. He has explained it all to them a million times. And still, when they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples cannot stay awake and pray. They cannot stay awake and pray. And so often when I read the story about the Garden of Gethsemane and I think about, and I think about, wow, wow, sorry, I just had this revelation from the Holy Spirit. Radiant Roz, my beautiful Radiant Roz friend, gave me a calendar last night and on the calendar it says it's time to return to the garden with me, I think. It is time to return to the garden with me. And I think often when we think garden, we, we think Eden. And just now, as I said that, I felt the Holy Spirit say to the garden of Gethsemane, it's time to return to the garden of Gethsemane and do what the disciples were unable to do, but to be those who stay awake and pray and intercede and ensure that Jesus gets his full reward because Jesus, and you know that Jesus here in this, in this space, in this space, he says to his father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And this is what I was speaking about at the prophetic school I've been speaking about for the last couple of sessions, this thing about dying to yourself. Jesus had free will. He could have, the angel came to strengthen him. He could have at that moment said to the Lord, said to God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And God would have said, you come home, my son. He had to choose to do what he did for us. He had to die to himself. Physically, emotionally, his mind, will, emotions, his soul had to come under the authority of the Spirit of God inside of him. And he had to die to himself. Because what does it say there? If you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but always yours be done. And again, the Amplified Bible adds always in there. Not my will, but always your will be done. And I was saying to the, to the prophetic school people last night, I was saying to them that I often say to God, I surrender my free will to you. I know you gave me free will, but I want to die to myself and therefore I surrender my free will to you because I only want to do your will. And last night for a moment, as I said it to them, I thought to myself, you know, you have these moments. I thought to myself, I wonder if that means, I wonder if I have a theological uh, basis for that, a theological foundation for that. And I do, right here. And that's why the Holy Spirit said to me now, it's time to return to the Garden of Gethsemane with me. Because we speak about being in a season of radical obedience. We speak about being in a season where we are being consecrated and set apart. We speak about being, you know, like Mary who said, you know, let it be done to me according to your will, God. And here we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And yet, not my will, but always your will be done. And there we have Jesus surrendering his will to God's will knowing full well 
what he was facing, knowing full well exactly what he was facing. He says, yet, not my will, but always your will be done. And that is the remnant that God is calling forth. A people who say, not my will, Lord, not my will, your will always be done. I secede my free will to you. I surrender my free will to you. Let it always be your will. And you know, then he has to go back over and over to wake the disciples up. And we do not want to be like those disciples. We do not want to be like those disciples. The church needs to wake up. The watchmen on the walls who have been sleeping need to wake up. And then, we, you know, we read through Luke 22 and Jesus is betrayed and by Peter, by Judas, by all of his disciples pretty much. They all run away and leave him. And we know the story of his crucifixion and him being on the cross. And I want to point out, because I do love to point this out, I think these things should be pointed out. That at the foot of the cross, it tells us in the Gospels, in the various Gospels that you read, that at the foot of the cross were three women and John. All the disciples, in, three women including the mother of Jesus, all the disciples, apart from John, had deserted Jesus, ran away, they were hiding, they had betrayed him, they had not stood by him in his hour of need. All the disciples, except for those women. And I want to say this to you, every woman here, it was women who stood at the foot of the cross and witnessed the death of Jesus. And it was women who were the first to witness his resurrection. And it tells you that in the biblical text, nobody can take that away from us. It was women who were strong enough, even in their grief and their wailing and their lamenting. It was Jesus's mother who was strong enough to stand at the foot of the cross, despite any potential consequences and witness her son be tortured and killed. All his disciples, and I saw somebody post something a while back, which said, you know, um, Jesus, all Jesus' disciples were male, which means that men are the chosen, you know. And somebody else said, Jesus' disciples might have been male, but it was women who stood at the foot of the cross. In his moment of agony, in his moments of pain and death and loneliness, it was women who stood there with John. And that is significant. It is significant because God knew that that would be the case. God ensured that that was going to happen, that those women stood at the foot of the cross. And John was there because Jesus then tasked John with looking after his mother. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, it was women who witnessed it and ran to tell the disciples who didn't believe them. And if you don't think that that is significant, you are wrong. Because Jesus' whole ministry was about restoring the equality of women. Lifting them up, validating them, affirming them, demonstrating to them that they were made in the image of God and they stood, maybe not societally, but in his eyes, shoulder to shoulder, equal to men. And when every single male disciple had deserted the Messiah, those faithful women stood there at the foot of the cross and witnessed him give up his spirit because they didn't kill him. The crucifixion couldn't kill Jesus. 
He was fully God and fully man. He had to willingly give up his spirit and choose to die. And that's why he says, he says that. Where does he say that? Into your hands. Luke chapter 23 verse 46. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with these words, he expired. He expired. And there he was. There he was. And there stood these faithful women who had never left him. Who had followed the whole way wherever he was I just think that that's amazing I just think that that's amazing and now we're running out of time I need to I, I want to just bless you I want to bless you on this Good Friday on this day that we commemorate the death of our Savior and I want to decree and declare over you that it is resurrection season. I spoke this out last night over the prophetic school. It is resurrection season. And God is blowing the breath of his spirit on the dry bones of the things that you think have died. In your life, in your family. He is blowing his resurrection breath over the dry bones of things that you think have died in your life and you are going to see them start to come back to life it is resurrection season ladies and gentlemen it is significant and let us celebrate it with our savior so i bless you all with a beautiful friday please keep our special sylvia and her family in your prayers and i pray for each and every one of you that you will encounter encounter God this weekend in the most incredible way. Bless you all. Love you all. I'll see you on Monday morning at 7am.